And this is why we feel like we've got to be present because if we're not present, somebody else is. Like this is just one little example. A flyer we found in North Carolina that says basically, you know, are you addicted to opioids? It's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. You deserve help. So quite loving in message. Please call us, the White Knights of the KKK. Hello and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. Hope you had a great holiday. It's great to have you back. We uh, we got some great feedback on our last episode, which was the um, our mailbag episode uh, with the one and only Tiffany Champion. Lots of people very happy to meet Tiffany Champion uh, by, by voice on the podcast. We had a good time with that. We will do definitely do it again. I'm excited for today's episode, which I think um, is a fitting kickoff to a year in which we will see the beginnings of the 2020 presidential campaign. We're five or six months, I think, from the first debate, which is insane. Elizabeth Warren has declared uh, that she's running for president. Julian Castro basically has as well. By the time this posts, there may be more, for all I know. And one of the big central questions for Democrats, for progressives, for people broadly on the kind of center left of American politics is like, what does this coalition look like? Who is in it? Who's not in it? Who's gettable? Who's not gettable? Where do you focus your attention and your energy? And, you know, for years, there was this kind of dominant ethos among Democratic Party operatives, which was the obsession with the swing voter. I watched this play out. Uh, Mark Penn, who was a uh, you know, famously a strategist for Hillary Clinton was one of the people that was the one of the kind of prophets of the swing voter, right? That there are these people normally almost always coded as white, um, white suburban voters who went this way and that. And you could appeal to them if you were a Democrat and you were like fiscally responsible and tough on crime. And like you checked all these boxes that made them not worry that you were too much of a lib. And then you can get them to vote for you. And that that thinking still exists in the Democratic Party. And there's lots of places if you go to those, if you go and look at how those races worked in a lot of the suburbs that happened and went for Democrats this year, there was a fair amount of that. There was a fair amount of, you know, getting someone in Orange County, which is not a real liberal place, getting a certain marginal set of voters in Orange County who are identified as Republicans or usually vote for Republicans to vote for you because you're, you know, you're not you're not too crazy of a liberal. That kind of like going towards the center idea has dominated a lot of the political conventional wisdom in the Democratic Party for a long time. And I think was a product of a lot of Democrats getting their butts kicked all over the place from McGovern through Reagan up to Bill Clinton. So that's one way of thinking. There's a newer school thinking about the sort of Democratic coalition that I think is a product of a number of things post Obama the demographic changes in America, and the kind of vanishing swing voter, where the idea is the country's polarizing. The number of people that bounce back and forth between the parties is shrinking. People have these kind of tribal affections and loyalties. The parties stand for incredibly distinct visions of existential truths about people, like who is an American, basically, who counts. And as such, the key is mobilizing your coalition both getting people enthusiastic, right? So as opposed to saying to that swing voter, like, here, come over here, like, I promise we won't bite. Like saying to the person who is with you, like, heck yeah, I'm going to go out and knock on doors. Heck yeah, I'm going to go make phone calls. I'm going to donate. I'm going to go tell people to, to register to vote. Getting the marginal person who maybe is registered but only votes every four to six years to vote in this election because they are so amped about you. That's a whole other way of thinking about how to win elections. And I think it's ascending in its dominance and I think has borne some real fruits. I think Beto O'Rourke and Stacey Abrams are two examples of, in some ways, those kinds of campaign in what was inhospitable terrain. Neither one, Stacey Abrams in Georgia, Beto O'Rourke in in Texas, but both really outperformed the fundamentals. Stacey Abrams coming very, very close to winning as a black woman in Georgia, right? Okay, so the reason I'm setting this up is because we're now, I am generally sympathetic to this latter model, which I think is in the ascendancy, which is about kind of like mobilizing your coalition, organizing and mobilizing your coalition, as opposed to the persuade the swing voters. But there's a kind of thing that happens when this mobilize your people idea gets taken to its most extreme logical conclusion, 
which is a kind of writing off that happens. Like this idea that like, look, we need to get our people together. We need to motivate them. We got to stop worrying about those folks who aren't going to vote for us. And sometimes those folks gets extended to like those swaths of the country where those folks live, like Wyoming, North Dakota, (laughs) South Dakota, Utah, Idaho, right? Tennessee, like places where like there's not a ton of libs. In some cases, there's not a lot of like young people and people of color and educated professionals that kind of make up the Democratic coalition. So those places don't have much for us. I'm now speaking in the voice of like a, you know, progressive strategist. And so like, eh, what are we going to do out there? And I think there's sort of two problems with thinking that way. Um, One is that like the way that American politics, federal politics works is like, we should have progressives running for and winning office everywhere in the country. Like, we can't just write off, like, huge swaths of the country uh, because, like, they don't have, like, the demographic ingredients to make a progressive majority. you got to figure out, like, how do you get good policies and good people elected there? But also because I think it overstates the issue. Like, this is something we're going to get to in this conversation. Think about a county that is a red county in your mind, say, in Kansas, okay? Let's say it went for Donald Trump by 40 percent, 70, 30. That's deep red. Like, that's a conservative place. Now, let's say there's 10,000 people in the county. OK, well, that's 3000 people that voted against Donald Trump. Those people, they're, that's not nothing like they're out there. And in some ways, that's some, those are some interesting folks. It takes a certain amount of independence of mind <laughs> in that environment, right? Like you're voting for Hillary Clinton or you're voting against Donald Trump or you're you're a pr- out and proud liberal in a county that's 70-30 Trump. It'd be good to know who those folks are. So my next guest's whole project right now is finding the answer to that question, right? In this new era, as people think about how you build a progressive majority, progressive coalition, how do you think about the people that live outside of the areas where that progressive majority, the kind of modern, diverse Obama coalition America that makes up the center left. What does organizing for progressive values look like in places that aren't like that? What does it look like in rural Indiana or rural Iowa or rural Nebraska, places that are predominantly, although not exclusively white, places whose voting behavior is very conservative? What does it look like on the ground to think about, imagine, putting in the beginnings of an infrastructure to create progressive change in those places. So my next guest is a guy named George Gale and who I've known for a long time. And I've known him because he came up through this organization called National People's Action, which was actually an organization that I worked for back in Chicago a little bit as a kind of contract writer that I had friends who worked for, that my father was associated back in the day, because it's an organization that works with community organizers and community organizations around the country. And community organizing, which is something you'll hear about in this conversation, is the process by which you get people together to build power, to make demands of people in power, and to change things for the better. And it starts with nothing. It starts with, like, putting up a few flyers saying, come to this meeting we're going to have about the local park. (laughs) And then you identify leaders And then you start having weekly meetings and then you've got a name for the organization and then you've got meetings with the local alderman about what needs to be cleaned up in the park. And before you know it, you're making demands. And that is really difficult, painstaking work. And it's work that has been underinvested in communities of color for way too long and been way too overemphasized on white, particularly affluent folks. But what George is trying to do right now in this project you're going to hear about is think about how in the 21st century, in the era of a pluralizing American democracy, in an era where a lot of white people are succumbing to really nasty views about blood and soil conservatism and Trumpism and building the wall and sort of essential conceptions of American identity as whiteness, how to go into the places where that view is taking hold and fight it, fight it on the ground, identify the people who reject that view and build power among them to talk to their neighbors to proffer a better alternative vision of what the future of America can look like. And I honestly think that's as exciting a political project as anything that's happening, because what happens if those places are left to go full Trumpist is terrifying to contemplate, and we're already seeing some of the fruits of it. And then, as you will hear, one of the things that makes George really an interesting person to listen to on this topic is He lives it. 
He is from the backwoods of Indiana. He has been down and out. He's gone through addiction and recovery. He's found himself in a a soup kitchen because he was strung out and hungry. And he's built a life back up from that. And he's got a real vision into what our politics, what a better version of our politics could look like. Where are you from, George? Yeah, I grew up in southern Indiana. So first uh, in a little town called Seymour, actually the birthplace of John Cougar Mellencamp, or we called him Johnny Cougar. Uh, and then a little town called Medora. So this is like deep southern Indiana and, and you know closer to Kentucky than to Indianapolis. And Medora was a town of, at that time, about 800 folks. You had to drive 40 miles to get to a town of 20,000. So super isolated. We lived next to the area lumberjack, Otis and his wife, Flossie, and right across the road from the county dump. But growing up, it was like good living. You know, my dad would take us down to cross the Medora covered bridge, which, you know, the people in Medora would tell you is the uh, longest covered bridge in the United States. My brother and I, you know, our basketball goal was, you know, a piece of barn wood put up on a telephone pole. And, you know, me and my brother would spend hours dribbling in the grass to try to get a like three by three area flat enough of mud so we could actually <laughs> feel the sensation of dribbling on hardwood. So we thought it was was great. And then we moved from there to Nashville, Indiana, which at the time was like, might as well have been moving to New York City. I later find out it's only a thousand people, but had a little more vibrancy there. But Medora um, has, is really one of these small towns that's gone through tough times. There was a brick plant that started in 1902 and basically cranked out 54,000 bricks, handmade bricks a day for 90 some years. And then it closed. And those were 50 jobs that people really depended on, particularly in a 800 person town. Yeah, and then there the was a, right, basically right. And then there was a plastics plant that also employed people in Medora and in the region, which was Jackson County. And that shut down. And so there's really not a lot left. I was back there visiting with my dad the other day. And finally, the last store in the downtown is closed. There's actually nothing nothing left. Nearby Scott County, which is a county over, was made national news in 2015. It was uh, one of the communities really hit hard by the opioid crisis. But in this case, in a town of 4,200 people in Austin, Indiana, 190 people contracted HIV from sharing a very small set of needles, um, and actually one of the most concentrated HIV epidemics in U.S. history. So a, a part of the country that's had a, had a rough go of it. Just to give you a sense of what life was like in this part of Indiana, I remember when the first black family moved to the school district. This wasn't an Alabama civil rights movement moment at school, but it was definitely like buzz around school and and a lot of chatter. And I remember going home and asking my dad, like, hey, well, what's this all about? Why is this, what's all this talk about? You know, my dad, who's, you know, grew up in a small town, too, he's like, well, son, when I went into the Air Force, I learned a couple of things. And one of them was there are white guys that are assholes and black guys that are assholes. And then he just stopped talking. And then after a minute, he said, all right, go back out in the creek and play with your brother. And so I just kind of walked out of the creek, pulled my jeans up and waded into the creek and just sat there thinking, what is this all about? But looking back, pretty sure that was a better introduction to race than a lot of kids living on yeah, Gracie I mean, Creek Road I, got that night. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. On the on the bell curve of things that <laughs> white, white rural dad can say when the first black kid moves into school. That's 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 not a bad one. Also a testament, I think, to the to the power of the U.S. Armed Forces as an integrated institution, which has actually been a, you know, enduring truth, I think, actually one of the more genuinely integrated spaces in American life. Yeah, I hadn't even really thought about it like that, but I think you're right, and it uh, certainly made a difference in my life. What did your dad like? What were what was your kind of, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, class profile? Like, what your what your dad do, and what what kind of house you live in? And in Medora, we lived in a house that was actually made of a uh, it was actually a barn. Somebody had like had some vision of turning into like a lodge or something, and it had given up. It was on you know forty some <laughs> acres, and my parents decided to figure out how to finish it into a house. So I'd say, you know, working class people, but my dad made and still does uh, 40 some years later, makes stuff out of metal and sells it. And a lot of that's actually kind of scenes of rural life, a barn or a fence with somebody's bicycle Mm. next to it and things like that. And then my mom eventually became a, a social worker. 
My parents busted up when I was around 11 or so, and we moved to Bloomington, Indiana, which has Indiana universities. Yeah, that's that's like, man, that's like uh, that's, beat poetry oh, yeah. and uh, reefer oh, and uh, <laughs> bongo drums. and. <laughs> In comparison, without question, uh, and I was angry as hell about it. You know, I was very content living out in the country, and that's all I knew. But when we got there, uh, a couple things happened, like, one, I, you know, didn't really, it's amazing that moving from Nashville, Indiana to Bloomington, Indiana would make a big difference. But I got made fun of because I said, I said wash instead of wash. And I said crick instead of creek and a lot of things like that. I didn't really, had never occurred to me. So there's a lot of kind mm. of teasing and not fitting in, mm. which actually was kind of a beginning of a trying to like dial back my rural roots, which, uh, you know, and eventually later dialing them back in. But, uh, but this school that we ended up going to was across the street from international student housing. And so this was the housing that international students who had kids stayed in at Indiana University. So suddenly I've gone from like running through the woods on three wheelers to my friends being from Zimbabwe and Malaysia and Nigeria and going over to their house to eat and smelling all this food that was like my senses were like alive. It was like a huge change, and in yeah. many ways, I look back. And honestly, at first, I didn't get it. I, you know, my mom says that I came home after the first week. I'm like, Mom, some of the kids don't even speak English, you know, which like I can't even imagine saying now. <laughs> but like, you know, that's all I knew, being from where I was from. And she always tells it like two or three weeks later, those were my best friends. And oddly, must have always been an organizer, Chris, because I organized that group to play the the what I saw as the rich kids in basketball every day at recess. And that was basically my obsession. I would like sit in class instead of paying attention, I'd get napkins from lunch and then write down, well, if Iswan could learn a better bounce pass and if Salvatore <laughs> maybe get a little jump hook and, you know, I'll, I'll work on this. And uh, we got beat 31 recesses in a row until we eventually evened the score. And, and now looking back, I'm like, if I had any global analysis, I would have formed a soccer team. I would right. have been yes, killing exactly. it from then day you one. Run I just, them off the court. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm Instead, a Hoosier. Right. So you're in. So so it's like you, like kid from the the sticks and the United Nations of Bloomington <laughs> kids against like the rich kids of Bloomington playing basketball every day. Yep, that's how it all came together. Yeah. And so then you stay in Bloomington. You go to high school. How do you get from there to being an organizer? Long story. Angry kid growing up. Got into a lot of trouble, and then got you know really deep into two drugs. Uh, and, and hard drugs. And eventually one day was, you know, kind of had really hit bottom and went to a soup kitchen on a place called Pigeon Hill, which is where public housing is in Bloomington. And, uh, you know, wasn't expecting to be there in some ways surprised to be there, but also really glad there was a soup kitchen that had food to eat. How old were you? And what, what I was, what was your, I think I was about 20 or something. I think I, you know, and around what was your, 20, I would guess. If you don't mind me asking, what was, yeah. what was the, what was the addiction? How did that, how did that start and how did that accelerate? You know, it was really white powder. So it started with uh, methamphetamines, cocaine, and freebasing, and even crack. Like those were the main. But you know, but I was I was open to lots of ways of feeling different. So mm-hmm. that, you know, included pills and lots of other things. It was part of a very intense drug culture. You know, clearly full blown addicted because I'd hit bottom many times and swore I'd get it together and, and just never seemed to be able to do it until I found the soup kitchen. What changed when you went to that soup kitchen? Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, I came a couple times then. I just noticed, I was like, oh, people that eat here also volunteer. And it might be as simple as, like, grabbing a bucket and a mop and mopping part of the floor or going and taking out a bit of trash or something. And I was like, oh, I, I can do that. Like, I should do that. So I started doing it. And then the strangest thing happened. Um, well, actually, I should back up. First, something horrible happened. Uh, a friend of mine uh, left me the suicide note and did kill herself. And in that note, she had said, you know, George, like, you're, I think you're a really talented person and, like, you're wasting away here. Um, and if anything comes of what I'm about to do, I hope you get your act together. Um, and so I spent a bunch of time obviously wrestling with whether I've always felt like I got the note you know, could I've could I've went and found her and all of these things, and uh, and that didn't you know that didn't happen. I didn't find her, and she did die. Um, and so, at a certain point, 
the cook in the soup kitchen, Vaness, asked me if I want to be in a play. And it ends up the guy that cooks food in the soup kitchen on Pigeon Hill in southern Indiana is Armenian from Beirut and wants to do avant-garde theater. So this is like <laughs> massive, <laughs> unexpected turn. And he wants me to play the boy in Equus, which is a play about a boy, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. No, you can't make it up. You don't know uh, how many lives Equus has saved, actually. Right. Is that true? It is a, no, I, not, well, I'm sort of half joking, but it's a great play. It's produced everywhere, and it's an incredible piece of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I felt lucky. For some of the, I was certainly not the theater kid in high school. Like, that was my first introduction. And... So Vaness asked me if I want to play this role, and I, you know, because of losing Jennifer and what she said to me in that note, I'm like, oh, I, I guess this is the thing. This is the thing in front of me that I could do to be better. Um, and wow. so he gave me, he made three eighty five an hour, and he gave me half of his wage to come in and rehearse, which actually was fairly hilarious because Equus is pretty out there and a lot of a lot of violence and yelling and whatnot. And he played the psychiatrist Dysart, and I played the kid, and we rehearsed in front of all these church volunteers. So I'm sure we're like, what the hell is going on here? And through that process, I eventually got a job washing the dishes. I was still using, like at the kitchen, I was still using as a kind of pseudo employee, but through a long process, got an actual job there washing dishes and then like cooking a little more of the food and got super into the people and to helping. And people needed me to, sh that's what happened. People needed me to show up. So I'll never forget Tommy Five, who was uh, 75 years old, developmentally disabled, uh, you know, would urinate on himself many days and, you know, pick up cigarette butts off the ground to get enough to roll up a cigarette. Like when he showed up at the kitchen, he needed me to like give him a job, like a mop or a rag to wash off a table, like a way to make meaning of all he was going through. And it just tons of experiences like that. I'm like, I have got to get my act together. And it was, it took a few years, but I got, I got clean at the kitchen and, uh, and put everything I had into it. And it gave me everything I needed to, to get out of the trouble I was in. Wow. That is an amazing story. So you, you get clean there and, and part of what gets you clean is other people depending on you. Yeah, I think so. I think that was it more than anything. It was like I can't show up here like wasted from the day before or wasted from what I did in the last hour. So what happens next? So three years into it, I look up one day and I'm actually mopping the floor at the end of the day and look out and it's like, wait, this is basically the same group of people eating here as the first day I came in and maybe more. But it looks really similar. And I didn't grow up, you know, I mean, Indiana isn't where you go to get your leftist analysis. Um, and I didn't grow up, you know, being taught about structures and systems and all of this. But I, I knew enough then to be like, OK, nobody's died on our watch from hunger. But at the end of the day, the reasons people are poor haven't changed either. And there's got to be a better way. And randomly... I found Rules for Radicals and, uh, you know, pulled it off the shelf. It's got a good title. It's red. I pulled it off and I read it. It's actually, it's, you know, this is Saul Alinsky's book about organizing. It's not a great manual on how to do it, but it was enough to teach me that there was another way to move forward. <laughs> so you're, you're working in a soup kitchen and you're looking out and you're saying, we're feeding these people, but nothing's changing. You're a white boy from the Indiana sticks in the back of a kitchen of, of the desperate poor in Hungary in Bloomington, Indiana, who has just gotten clean, and you just happened upon Saul Linsky's <laughs> Rules for Radicals in a bookstore right, yeah. and decided to read it. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's, it just happens to be true, but yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> it's a hell of a story. Then you got into organizing. Yeah, basically then started to uh, ask people at the kitchen to like sit down and, ask, you know, like we started asking questions so, like, what issues are you upset about? Basic organizing questions, what, you know, what issues you care about, things like that. And then started knocking on doors in public housing and, and there was a homeless shelter next to the kitchen. And we got, a few of us got good at getting a lot of people together, but we really didn't know strategy and some, some of the real basics of organizing we just didn't know yet, but we could always seem to get a lot of people together. And this word got out about this in, to somebody in Indianapolis. I got invited to a meeting in Indianapolis about tenant organizing. And there was a guy, and he had a three-piece suit on, which to me was like major red flag at the time. But he kept saying things like, power concedes nothing without a demand. You have to have targets, winnable issues, all these you know, kind of basics in, uh, of organizing. 
And I got back to Indiana. I'm like, I need that guy to come down here. So called him up and said, look, we got, we got enough money to pay for your gas and feed you. But if you could come down, I can get 20, 25 people in a room and you could break down what this organizing thing is for us. And I think it'll be worth it. And he came down and he did it and it made total sense. Uh, and, and honestly, we were off and running, built a poor people's organization, started winning on issues. And, you know, that was a good 20 years ago and haven't looked back. Who was that? His name was Mike Evans. I'm glad you asked that because like a super important mentor who, you know, might not make it in the history books, but had a huge impact on my life. I, I really don't know what I'd be doing if I hadn't met him. And I should give full disclosure here, which is that you end up at an organization called National People's Action that my father was associated with when he was a community organizer back in the day coming up through Chicago. It was founded by a guy named Shell Trapp who actually trained directly with Saul Linsky. So there's a kind of like familial yeah. connection here, National People's Action. Mm-hmm. You're now the director of People's Action, the People's Action Initiative, which is a kind of like umbrella group that works with a bunch of local community organizing groups across the country that organize on all kinds of stuff. And you've been doing this now for 20 years, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah. A lot of National People's Action was based in, and, and this was true of my father, who was an organizer in the in the Bronx, you know, based in urban environments and communities of color, poor communities of color particularly, places that don't have a lot of social capital, places that uh, like back of the yards in, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, in Chicago, which is where Saul Linsky got his start, where it's like private industry and the government railroads you because you don't have social capital. They don't care about you. But if you get together and you make demands and you bring some pressure on people, you can start to get wins and you can start to get victories and you can start to change the structures for the people that live in your community and improve the life of the people around you. And that model, you know, has been the all sorts of organizations around the around the country following it. And the work you're doing now involves that, but it also involves organizing in places that are far from urban centers, right? That's right. Yeah. You're sort of focusing a bit more on or you have a sort of channel of your organizing that is that is basically you know, organizing among white rural folks. Yep, that's right. I mean, we made a decision really as Trump ascended before he was even the Republican nominee and, and before he uh, you know, got elected president that it was clear that the broader we needed more uh, organizing and infrastructure building in rural and small town communities and that we we had ceded that turf to the right for way too long and we were now really paying the price for it in a different way. Um, but it didn't mean we had to cede that turf any longer. So we made a decision to scale up a project to go out and talk to thousands of people in rural communities. Um, we focused on a, a set of places. One were Obama to Trump counties. Um, so you know there were 700 counties that voted for President Obama twice. A third of those went to Trump. And in many cases, the swings were 20 to 30 percent. Um, areas of the country that were in like just economic free fall and people are hurting. And if we are who we say we are as progressives, we care about that and we want to be there. And we also looked for places where there was like a a rise in visible white nationalist organizing and wanted to actually be a counterforce in a set of those places. So a a couple quick things about that. We've just finished 10,000 conversations, many of them on the front porch, some of them at soup kitchens and, you know, food banks and churches where we asked a couple questions, which we could come back to. And then we've also helped kind of facilitate a, a mini migration back home. So on election night 2016, a number of people who are white organizers living in major cities decided, you know what, I think I got to go back home and organize my people. Mm. And so we've tried to facilitate helping people get back. And in some cases, they're moving to states that, you know, political operatives would be excited about like North Carolina or Wisconsin. And then some of them are moving to states like Alabama and Indiana. It's going to be hella hard to raise money for those places. But regardless, we've helped people do that. So I think we're running the biggest or one of the biggest economic and racial justice rural outreach strategies in the country. We have competition, but the competition is is the alt-right, the Klan, and, you know, the Republican Party. So I, I want to. So you said two things there. You're, you're focusing on places that were Obama, Obama, Trump counties, rural, predominantly white. I mean, that's almost definitionally right. So there are, <laughs> right. there are no Obama, Obama, Trump counties that are predominantly black and places where the, the alt-right or white supremacist, white nationalist organizing. What, what do you mean by that? Where is that happening? What's that look like? 
so Alamance County in North Carolina, huge white nationalist organizing happening there. That was a reason we, we helped uh, facilitate a migration there. Um, lots of stuff around Confederate flags and Confederate monuments, very visible public organizing. And so it felt like we needed to have a, a counterforce there. Maybe less explicitly white nationalist, but in Stafford, New Jersey, in this last election cycle, a Make America Great Again slate ran and primary. Stafford's like a town of 27,000 people. This Make America Great Again slate ran on a platform that was basically keep immigrants out and the guns in, which is hardly your usual municipal uh, platform. Yeah. Um, and they beat the incumbent Republicans in every race, mayor on down. One other thing that we're dealing with is, and this is why we feel like we've got to be present, because if we're not present, somebody else is. Like, this is just one little example, but like, and I could send you a, a copy of it, like a flyer we found in North Carolina that says basically, you know, are you addicted to opioids? It's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. You deserve help. So quite loving in message. Please call us, the White Knights of the KKK. Holy so shit. Holy shit. They are shit. out organizing like crazy, and sometimes it feels like progressives of the left have said, whatever, we're going to, you know, we're moving on. And for us, I guess I'd say three things. It's like, first, the, our orientation towards rural communities should be humanitarian first. If progressives are who we say we are, it's like people are suffering, and like we care about that. And yeah. then second, like... Um, we have to be there and inform meaning making. It's actually bigger than elections, but where there's a, a whole battle for meaning making and hearts and minds long term. I think we've both got room to go up. And I also think we've not hit bottom. I think that's a really important point. Like, there's a world in which every rural white county in America votes like a rural white county in Alabama. Yep. That's a thing that could happen in America's future. And what that would do in America's politics and, and, the, and the results it would produce at every level of government are horrifying to contemplate. And I don't think enough of us have sat down and really contemplated what that looks like. And, you know, you look at that, you know, say a pop up in a New York Times map of a, the last election or the 2016 election, and you see that big sea of red. I think we tend to write off that sea of red instead of remember that in most of those counties, 35, up to 49 percent of people voted Democrat. Right. Um, and but I don't know. We have to figure out what we're doing to make them want to do that in the next election and the ne next election. Um, and I think it, th these are voters that I think we take for granted and, and at our own peril. So there's a lot I want to talk about here. I want to hear what you're hearing out on the ground and, and what meaning making is and what you think the path is here. But first, I want to sort of present the critique that I know people are having in their head right now. And it's one that it's interesting to watch these these fights. They're both ideological and factional in the in the broad center left coalition about this exact issue. I think partly the way that the mainstream press has kind of fetishized the white rural voter in certain ways as an authentic expression of what the actual American will is. And I think mm -hmm. also the kind of overcorrection of kind of metropolitan media, metropolitan based media to say like, well, we missed it and we got blindsided by 2016. We have to go talk to Trump voters in Trump country and Trump country, Trump country. Let's do another Trump country safari. Mm -hmm. There's a real strong feeling among a lot of people on the left. I think particularly people of color like, fuck that. Fuck that. Right, right, right. Like, what the fuck? We, first of all, we won the popular vote by 3 million people and land gets a vote in the U.S. Senate. But like, OK, fine. But that doesn't mean that they have some special hold on the American imagination or American popular democracy, A. And B, our views are just as valid as, as theirs. And C, this whole like, oh, they're suffering economic anxiety. Well, you know what? Poor black folks on the south side of Chicago are. And they didn't vote for some clown, uh, some pseudo authoritarian clown. So like, screw those people uh, and stop obsessing over them. And I hear that all the time. And I know you do too, but I'm just like giving you the full run of the <laughs> spiel to, to get your response to. Let's see a few things. I think in people's action things like people of color, women and young people are like the center of the progressive movement and are the future and the leadership and the present. And we think black people and black women in particular are like the most dependable part of that coalition. Two, I just to say that in a lot of these frames, sometimes people say rural. The other thing people say is white working class. I think it's actually a problematic frame and that we 
we actually are not as dedicated to talking about the black working class or the Latinx working class. So we, we associate work with whiteness only. Right. And so good, I think that's a very b- big problem that we have to, you know, I'm fine with us using the term, but let's use it with everybody. Right. Agreed. Um, third, we're like making progress, you know, whether you're on the progressive movement of having a, a deeper analysis around race and around gender and the structures therein. And like, we shouldn't take the pedal off the gas. We should keep moving forward. And then finally, I would say we don't want to overcorrect. So overcorrect could be like moving tons of resources that are, you know, finally not enough, but moving to communities of color to build infrastructure in those communities to white communities. We also don't want to center that the solution is somewhere around whiteness. I think it would be a huge mistake. And I think within that, there could also be a move to basically let's say like let's moderate our message and do kind of race neutral work election work or organizing work in majority white communities to be honest we've tried that before and it didn't work too well so i would say those are all like considerations we have to have totally and i think what's different in in this work and the way we're trying to construct it is we are sending race conscious organizers into majority white areas who are able to actually move people over time because i mean here's what's happening you've my take is you've got all of this is happening at like the nexus of capitalism and racism so you've got right. a bunch of people who did quite well or at least quite well compared to communities of color in the old kind of economic order descending and so people are descending and they're trying to make meaning of it so there's like two main meanings i think people tend to make is one is to blame yourself, which I think is kind of one of those outcomes I think we're seeing is like the deaths of despair. There's this guy at, at John Hopkins, Andrew Churlin, that talks about reference group theory. And if you really want to understand people and their behavior, understand who and what they're comparing themselves to. And so I think you have a set of white people comparing themselves to a previous generation. And so there's some self-blame yeah. and a lot of guilt and shame and there are yeah. a lot of drinking and opioid use. And I think it's I think it's a real issue. I see it in people I know. And then the others to blame others and the power of othering and racism is uh, is amazing and and works. And then you have a set of right wing forces like stoking that resentment, whether it's Fox News and Rush Limbaugh or new things like Richard Spencer and Steve Bannon and others totally taking advantage of that. And I think our thinking is we want to get in there and be meaning makers and help people point their anger and their love in the right direction. And if we do that, we're going to have way different results. But I think the key distinction being race conscious, even if you're doing if you're organizing in a damn near monoracial community, it's race conscious. And then what we do is we find the right moments when somebody starts to say, well, it's the immigrants or it's this or that is go, really? You know, and, and move into a conversation around what real structures are here. People come to the conclusion with enough work that we found the enemy and it's not each other. It's, uh, you know, undocumented immigrants didn't crash the economy. It, Muslims aren't the ones stashing tons of money in corporate tax havens. And it's certainly not black people like peddling opioids in rural America. <laughs> That's for damn it's sure. Like big banks. It's you know, big pharma. It's the tax dodging CEOs. And so like if we work with people enough around that analysis, I think people move to a different place. I think the key thing, that thing you said about we've tried race neutral before, like the old method, and, and I would even say this is the Alinsky method, is like you go into a community and like you're organizing these people, these white folks, because this company's going to leave town and you want them to not leave town or they're going to build a dump somewhere. Mm-hmm. And you're organizing around that and you're in the meetings and like, yeah, they're dropping the N-word left and right. And you're just kind of bracketing that. <laughs> you're like, right, right, you're like right. not cool, not cool. But, you know, OK, we're on, we're on the same page on the dump, on the town dump. We're on the same page on the on the jobs leaving. And that is a, that's been a method. I mean, the, the idea was like you work from commonality, you work your way out. And what what I'm hearing from you is like, no, you go at that when the person says the thing about the immigrants. Exactly. A, and specifically that was the, and affirmatively as the point of the organizing. Exactly. They were, I, I was definitely trained in the model, like keep people focused on the thing we're trying to solve versus digging in around the race issues. And so it does require the people that are doing this work. So, you know, so we've done these 10,000 door knocks. I would say a third of the folks that answer the door are just like pleased as punch to have somebody with our worldview knock on the door. 
in. I mean, because nobody, because it never happens. You mean in like these rural communities. liberals, basically, or, or non yeah. non conservatives, basically? Yeah, yeah, non conservatives. Yeah, whatever rural liberal looks like, those folks are like hell right, yeah. Right, because your point is your point. Is, this is always the thing I you got to remember. Like the big the red county in one color is you know it went two thirds one third. Like the one third of the people are still there. You knock on their door, they're like, hey, awesome, <laughs> awesome, and they're like, I mean, I I think they've become over the last ten to twenty years also more closeted right. in their politics, less likely to put the Democratic sign up. I think it's become really hard to be a liberal or a progressive in some of these communities. And so then it becomes closeted and you certainly don't build power nope. in that way. And I would say on the other end, a third of the doors we knock on, either just super conservative to full-blown racist. And that comes out on the doors and like our organizers just like move to the next door. This is not, mm-hmm. we don't have enough resources to deal with this. And then a group in the middle that's, I would say, part is like the exhausted majority of people that are just kind of like over it and not really paying attention and just cynical about about politics and and engaging in civic life and then another group that like totally would come to a meeting around stopping corporate agriculture or uh, around expanding health care and may say something dog whistle on right. the doors right and the organizers are trained to kind of make a decision like okay let's get this person to the meeting and get them engaged, but we're going to come back to that. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So, so, and then there's a political education, but really quickly, and again, we're in the weeds of organizing. We get people in fights and they start winning and they're in a multiracial context uh, and, and people change. Like it, we see it all the time. People what do you change. mean? How do, how, describe that. I mean, so Jeremiah Janes is a seventh generation Appalachian resident, grew up very poor, um, has struggled with addiction, been incarcerated. And uh, when the family separation crisis hit at the border, he felt moved by that. But mm. he had historically thought the immigrants were the enemy and they were out to get his job. Like that's what he was raised to think and he believed it. Um, but it, he had been wor- washing dishes with some, some uh, Mexican dishwashers who were migrants and sent money back home. He had joined this organization down home in North Carolina. And through the kind of political education and the conversations he thought about, he once got uh, arrested because he was driving his wife to work on a suspended license. He didn't have enough money to make bail, so he was locked up for three months. His daughter, who was very close to, had to have surgery, and he was not able to get out and be there with her. And it was a pretty serious surgery, and he was a mess around it. And all of that together combined for him to have, like, know what it felt like to be separated from his kid and to feel powerless around it. And he ended up fighting like hell to come to the border. His flight got canceled, but as an aside, but we got him on the stage at the Families Belong Together March on June 30th, certainly the only white Appalachian man on stage that day. And he told this story to 50,000 people and, you know, and it's gone big on video and whatnot. But he's just one example of somebody that started in a very different place and is now a advocate for migrant rights. You know, I think part of the weirdness of the political moment we're in is that we have these categories and these sort of shortcuts and they can be demographic or they're they tend to be like the shortcuts of polling internals. And, you know, because I think partly the success of the the alt-right or or white nationalists or sort of white nationalist inflected Trumpism Mm -hmm. um, is like people lose sight of the fact that like people's identities aren't fixed. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And what what they what they view is like and their politics aren't fixed and the primacy of what they think is the most important thing about them and their relationship to others and who they view as the enemy and who they view as an ally. Those aren't fixed either, but they also don't change on their own. They change through active engagement that is someone and someone's got to supply that yeah i think if if we are present with people i mean i think it will take a mix of things we've got to be present in more places um without question to have this you know or we would not know jeremiah and would not be able to make that happen but and we also are trying to figure out what is the kind of media overlay in some of these communities that gives people other alternative ways to make meaning of what's happening because one of the challenges we'll face is people will get involved in our organization locally start to have uh, an awakening but then they go back into a fox rush hannity yeah. ban and surround sound that's hard to push back against but but we we see people shifting 
all the time. And, and one of the areas we're focused on is immigration because we think it's one of the, the, the most divisive ones right now. What's surprising you? You got these 10,000 conversations and I imagine there's data, notes, stuff that sort of get passed up and you, you guys are talking about and analyzing and thinking about your, your, your keeping this going. Like, what are you, what are you learning? What's surprising you? Let's see. I mean, healthcare is the number one issue far and away. I don't know if I would have guessed that two or three years ago, but mm. healthcare is the number one issue far and away and actually quite similar, whether male or female. Clean water, number two. Um, really? And yeah, and it really, the reasons are often different, but you know, it could be, you know, fracking a pipeline, agricultural runoff, but clean water is huge. Um, and then this isn't surprising, but opioids and addiction has, has tended to be number three. Um, so, I mean, I, in, in many ways, those issues make sense. They are also issues that cut across to urban communities. I mean, clean water shows up when we knock on doors in urban cities and suburban, exurban areas and rural areas. I actually think it's one of the great uniters and a super interesting issue in that even conservatives believe government should play a role. Yeah. And making sure our water is clean. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think I'm surprised by like how hungry the existing Democratic voters are to engage and build organizations. They see it was like they were waiting for us to knock on their door and then they're they're showing up and doing things really, you know, quickly and at scale um, back to the families belong together moment and issue. On June 30th, there was, that was the big expression. There were 750 demonstrations or rallies across the country. And the media never really covered this, but half of those happened in counties that went for Trump. Hmm. And lots of them happened in very small town and rural communities. And one example is uh, Eldora, Iowa, which is in the only county in the state in Iowa that has a contract with ICE, which actually is what helps keep their jail open. Um, their jail would probably have to close without that. But uh, Julie Dunn, you know, is a resident there, and she's not proud of having the only deal cut with ICE in the state. And so she organized this rally in this town of 2,600 people. Like eight of the people that showed up she knew and four she didn't. But actually kind of a risk maybe in a county that went 66 percent for Trump. It made the front page of the Eldora News however big that is. Um, and then she decided to take it further. And we organized these country cookouts around the country that were designed to get families together to talk about family, to talk about family separation, and then to pass the hat for families that needed money to post bail and bond at the border. Lots of rural folks signed up to organize those cookouts. And People organize friends and family to show, show up. And even in Julie's case, um, her husband, who's a Trump voter, he still ran all the errands for the cookout. You know, he went and got the charcoal and the ice and all of that. So even at some of these cookouts, like Trump voters came and in large part because their wife told them to. But uh, I, I think and I think it's really fascinating that you could you could say the biggest expression in rural America against the Trump agenda was on family separation. I think that was the, there were more mobilizations on that than anything else, uh, and kind of an amazing story. I'm always surprised it didn't get get covered that way. You but. know, it's funny. I I, I went to a uh, I was upstate uh, in Ulster County, which is you know partly rural, but the the place that they they held the you know there's there's liberals around towns like Kingston and and, and New Paltz and, and places yeah. like that. But they had a they had a really big showing on that day. I was up there in in Kingston. Um, and kind of couldn't get over it, you know? I mean, this was, you know, oh. hundreds and hundreds of people outside the town hall on a swelter. I mean, it was like 96 degrees. I remember I was out there with my three kids, like, in the shade, and my middle son, David, being like, why are we here? What are we doing? <laughs> I'm sure, yes. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> it was like a... squirming around. I was like, all right, another 10 minutes, buddy. We'll, 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 go get some, uh, we'll go get some sandwiches. Yeah, my daughter's like, man, Trump means we have to carry a lot of signs. Um, so, yeah, yeah, same thing. I also wonder how you how you put this together with your own biography or how you think about it. I mean, growing up where you grew up and having gone and battled addiction and knowing that that's a thing that I don't think it's crazy to say a record number of people living in rural America are currently doing. Mm -hmm. Like pro it's probably the worst it's ever been. At least since we've been taking da keeping data of people that are living far from metropolitan centers, far from a, 
a ton of economic activity and, and into the midst of battling an addiction? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I guess, I mean, I know my addiction at least started out of a lot of pain uh, and trauma. And I didn't, we didn't use that word back then. I wouldn't know what that meant. But uh, And so I think have a lot of empathy for the fact that, like, clearly people are, are hurting and trying to make meaning and uh, not feeling good about themselves and feeling isolated and separated. And, like, like I want to fix that. Um, so I would say that being one. And then I'm blessed, I feel like, somehow to have – there's not many people like I know that grew up in rural parts of the country, then moved and lived with kids from all across the globe, and then moved to Chicago. And I've had like incredible race mentors for the last 20 some years. And if you include my friends back from playing basketball, you know, another decade before that. So feel lucky to be like constantly being schooled by particularly black women around race and helping sharpen my analysis, but also having a sense that we also need to do this work in rural America, which to me is both like has to happen humanitarian wise. It has to happen politically. And even when organizing white people, I think of it as racial justice work. I think of it as maybe the most important racial justice work I can do as a white man. Explain more. Well, I think Malcolm X said, well-meaning white people, we need you to go to the front lines of where racism is, and it's in your community. Right. (laughs) We got this. Your folks are acting out. Go there. And so I feel like as a white man and also somebody that grew up in the kind of communities that are definitely voting very much against racial, economic, and gender justice, like... I've got an obligation to help figure out how to move other white folks to go take on that work, whether it's popular or not. It has to happen. And in doing that, I think we're freeing up a lot of space for leaders of color to lead in communities of color. Right. So it feels like a twofer that's needed to happen for a long time. But popular or not, it just feels so certain it has to happen. Um, yeah. What yeah. when you? I want you to talk more about this idea of making meaning because I've been I've been sort of puzzling that over. It's a very profound phrase. I like it a lot, but I'm I'm not quite sure I understand what it means. I guess I think like there's so many changes in you know globally, but let's just say in people's lives right now, there's just so many changes and so much is changing. Like kind of right in people's communities, but also in throughout society. You know, whether it's tech or uh, uh, changing demographics, you know, uh, the future of work, right. all these different things that are shifting. Like, who's going to help people make meaning of why that is happening and what it means? And, and honestly, who's responsible? Um, and I think in many ways that the right has had a significant meaning making machine designed to help people come to certain conclusions around why these shifts are happening, who's behind them, and why the conditions in your life are worsening. And if we don't have meaning makers in communities, and I would say that in any community, and and that means, I mean, community leaders, faith leaders, business leaders, education leaders, but also media and communications and other content, like things will not go well for us. And just to say, this is we focused a lot on white people, but th- there's a real struggle in, particularly in rural Latino communities, have been more likely to move, definitely voted for Trump in most cases at a much higher level than they did for Romney. And um, yeah. and certainly people in a lot of rural uh, Latino communities in the Southwest are not, you know, do not have a progressive immigrant yeah. immigration worldview. So... I just think the project of helping people make meaning of things, it's the job of an organizer, but I think it's actually probably the most important project in America right now. I got to say that um, in some ways I have found this one of the most hopeful conversations that we've had because a lot of times we bang our head against the, you know, structural impediments. And do you feel hopeful doing this work? Doing this work? Yeah. I mean, when we're doing this work, oh, yeah, the stories of change, the stories of new organizations being built by these these folks migrating back home, the transformation of individuals, 
and the transformation are go both ways. Like I was in a room the other day with an African-American woman in, in Alamance County, n- North Carolina, where there's been this uptick in white nationalist activity. And it's a room of, of other rural and small town folks, uh, majority white. And she says, uh, you know, I never plan on getting involved in anything. And then this down home North Carolina organizer knocks on my door. And I think, you know what, my son's black. Life's going to be hard for him. I'm going to go to a meeting. And she gets involved and uh, starts to see change happen. And then she sits back in this meeting where we're reflecting together, and she's like, I didn't plan on getting involved, but I sure as hell didn't plan on getting involved with a bunch of white people. (laughs) And she's like, but you all are really trying to sort this out. Like, I'm watching you guys asking questions, making mistakes, but you were trying to wake up. And like, I will never bunch white people all into one Mm. group again because of this experience. So we're, I think, and this is happening at scale in different places around the country. I do think in us, you know, talking today helps. Like, I'm afraid this is like the best kept secret in the world right now. And we have to figure out how to bring it out into the light. There's not been a lot of media coverage of this work. Everybody, we took, the media we talked to once, they're like, send us the Obama to Trump voter. There's an over obsession over the Trump to Obama voter. I'm interested in the, the Obama to Trump counties. There were different dynamics there, but I think, but I, I guess I'm just saying the stories of people building across race and place, I think are being undertold. And if you, if people heard them, they would be as hopeful as I am. George Gale is the director of People's Action and People's Action Institute. Um, he's someone I've known for a, a long time and does incredible work. His wife, Ai-jin Poo, uh, who runs the Domestic Workers Alliance and also does really incredible work, you may have heard of as well. And uh, it, it's so great to have you on, George. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Once again, my thanks to George Gale, director of People's Action, uh, which is a national organization that's doing the kind of work he talked about and a lot of other work as well. If you want to, you can check out their work. We will link to it uh, in the transcript. As always, uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can tweet us, hashtag withpod, or email withpod at gmail.com. We got fantastic feedback from all of you on the mailbag episode, which I guess is kind of meta feedback, is feedback on the feedback. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll have our next mailbag episode devoted solely to feedback on the first mailbag episode. Um, so we can <laughs> we can just talk about the last mailbag episode on the next mailbag episode. But it was great. It's been great to hear from all of you. Um, really, it's it's we're, we're we're super gratified. We'd love to hear from you. Keep the suggestions coming. Keep the feedback coming. Why is this happening? Is presented by MSNBC and NBC News. Produced by the All In Team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here, by going to NBCNews.com/slash Why is this happening.